On this week's episode of Whitetail Cribs, we're headed to Indiana to visit with Tim Pittenger. Tim is a taxidermist and a retired law enforcement officer. His home is full of family memories, big whitetails, and a ton of taxidermy. If you'd like to help us out, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe for more Whitetail Cribs episodes. Hello, I'm Tim. This is my wife, Sheila. Welcome to the Pittenger House. Oh, right off the bat, obviously, this is the duck right in our, our entrance of our living room. It's a sentimental duck to me. This is one of the first ducks I ever mounted before my taxidermy career started out. So, obviously, detail-wise, it's not the best, but it means a lot, and it's still going good. So, come on back. Well, this is our main bedroom. We all know what this room is. Um, obviously, we like to keep our guns out all the time. That's the police in me. Um, other than that, it's pretty simple. I always look at my wife and I's uh, wedding picture every night before I go to bed. It means a lot. Uh, in here, the only real sentimental thing I have is I bought my wife a nice bidet. All you guys out there need to buy your wife a nice bidet. They'll love you. All right, come on. All right, downstairs is where I keep my camouflage. We keep it in just this spare room. This is pretty much our only storage room, so I'm a big believer in the Sitka gear. So I've got my heavy duty Sitka gear, got my wife a Sitka gear jacket, um, got the old scent blocker, which I've killed a lot of deer in, uh, the snow camo, my duck gear, it's all right here. This tote down here has my necessities that I use typically early season, um, whatnot, you can see in there, I got rain gear, face mask, extra bags, heated socks, all that good stuff. So that is pretty much all the camo that I mess with. So we can head up this way. Now this, this is the main part of the living room. Uh, a few years back we decided to add on and that wall right there was the end of the house. So my wife wanted her dream kitchen, I wanted my dream man room, so we did construction and got it done. So right this way, um, this is our lounging area after a hard day's work, hard night's work, whatever my wife's got going on. We'll like to sit here and look at our, our fire, um, built a little fireplace for us. Um, obviously our family. This is my oldest, Jenna, Mackenzie, and we got Kaylee and Isaac. So they're the reason uh, for everything, and we love them. So this is our little comfort area. So we'll go out this way to the kitchen. So this is our new add-on out here. My wife wanted a dream kitchen. I think she got it. Um, we have a calendar right here by my wife that she loves to do every year, and it's, it's memories of our family. So every month we, we have something different on there, but it's, it's all about our family. So that's, that's a big thing. Dinner's at night. The refrigerator, typical refrigerator. We, we've got our apple sauces, our milks, waters. Um, we do a lot of jerky making, so I've got all my soy sauces and Worcestershire sauce and all that. Um, got a steak, look like it's ready to be going out. This is called a crammed freezer. When you have kids in the house, they've got everything they need, and so do we, pizzas. Mini pancakes, toast drills, all the good stuff. So. Okay, um, these tables over here, we decided we had some old furniture. My wife's like, could you build something new? So I went and bought some walnut slabs and worked on them last fall and built her a walnut table and a bench. So when we have family over, this room gets used really well. So outside are my second favorite things which is my passion of fishing. As you can see, I have my 2017 Phoenix Bass Boat, which gets used a lot. Um, my favorite color, if you couldn't tell, is orange and black. So my K&M 850, I've gotta have this when I'm deer hunting our property because of the deep ravines. They always die in the bottom of them and I can never get them out, haul them out. You'd have to cut them up, you'd have to pack them out. So this goes on every hunting trip. Um, the Phoenix, it'll get used here in about the next week, clear up until December. It's got all the good little goodies on it. Got to have the goodies, right? So this is the storage area for it. This is our pole barn. As you can see, remnants of this year's success is where I butcher my deer too. So I do a lot of my own butchering, own jerky making, um, and we do it right out here. We'll do a spring cleanup later. So we store all our pool furniture and all the goodies over there. Trailer, haul the four-wheeler on. 
this is pretty much it when it comes to my hunting stuff. I've got all new order boxes of sticks for stand placements this year. Got a couple new places I want to put some stands up. Do love my summit climbers. They're a necessity. A lot of things change up. Where those don't work, I go to those. So I keep them hanging out here, scent free, obviously, and until till it's ready to be used. I've got a couple ground blinds over here. They'll be put out. But for the most part, this is where we kind of clutter all of our, our stuff. So come on in. We'll show you the shop. Oh, yeah, my sign. What was I thinking? So this was my business for almost 24 years. I was a full-time police officer for almost 24 years, uh, canine handler. And then I transitioned to this at retirement. Um, that was a sign I had in the yard. Number don't work, so don't worry about calling it. But uh, when I finally started retiring the taxidermy business and only doing it for a certain clientele, I decided to uh, take it out of the yard so the phone calls would slow down. So there it stays. And got my, my wife's pool put in this year, so she's happy. Happy wife, happy life. <laughs> My wife loves to do signs about every month. She'll put a new phrase on there, and we'll read it and understand it and think, that's pretty awesome. So, Now in here, we have my taxidermy shop. This is where I've been doing my work for years. Um, we put outdoor doors on it for scent control, but I can come right from the house, go right in here and do my work, watch kids, kiss the wife, do whatever I have to do, and then come out here and do my business. So... As you can tell, I've got a few mounts left in here. I don't do it on a level I used to do it at, which was about 100 deer a year. I've slowed down. More time for me, family. Um, but the ones I do get, um, this is where it gets done at. So a couple ducks I've, I've finished up. Um, this deer right here, the guy bleached the racks out and then decided to have it mounted. So that's why it's white. It's an actual real, real deer. But this is the process right before I paint it, when I get all the detail work done. And now I go into the airbrush and finish it. This is a stage right before that. So you got everything pinned in place. Nothing moves. Detail's good. You pull them out. Finished product will look like this guy right here. So these are a couple finished buttes. Soon to be picked up. And if you couldn't tell, when my passion for deer, when, the, when that time of the year is over, I go strictly into fishing. So I'm a little over the top on my fishing, but I've been doing it for years. Love to do it. Um, I even make my own lures now. Got some molds, tink around in that. Um, down here, I got a few pictures of some of the bucks I've killed over the years. Obviously, not all of them. Um, these two pictures right here were kind of sentimental because that was back when I first started putting food out after the season was over. I mean, that was in 2009. I would haul pounds of corn a mile back in the woods on a sled just to get some pictures to see what made it. So those two pictures were the first two I ever got. So pretty sentimental. Um, my daughter with one of my big bucks that you'll see in there. This picture right here was the very first year I opened taxidermy. You can see how young I am. I was doing a Ducks Unlimited convention and uh, somebody took that picture for me so I had it framed. This would have been my last year's um, taxidermy uh, paper that has all my prices and sheets on that my wife made which she did an amazing job on. So that's very sentimental. We keep that up there. And when I come out here and work, this is like my memory lane. Kids would make me stuff from school, tell me they love me. Um, obviously, my family is number one. Um, best Valentine's Day gift ever this year for my wife. Thank you. Um, but all my kids and stuff up there, and I love to look at it. So um, These are some of my turkeys that I've had over the years, a couple of Rios from Texas. Haven't done anything with them. When you have a taxidermy business, you don't get much of your work done. So now that I'm retired, I'm playing catch up. So plan on doing something with them. This was the biggest turkey I ever shot. If you look at this picture right here, it was in 2009. It weighed 29 pounds. So I've never even been close to that. It was actually shot May 2nd, 2002, actually. So big, big turkey. Had plenty of turkeys over the, <laughs> over the years. We've got a good population, so it's been good. Okay, so this is where I bring customers and where I put my mounts. These are my personal success stories in this room here. My wife got a dream kitchen. I get my dream man room. Come on in, check it out. So obviously if you could tell, 
Being a law enforcement officer was probably the best thing I ever did in my career. Um, I was very proud of it. I'm still very proud of the guys that are still doing it, that are my friends. Uh, a little holler out to Gatton and Blake and a couple of you other guys. But my wife's like, we need to do some memories of your uniforms and stuff. So my wife did the boxes for me. Amazing. So there's not a day I don't look at that and remember it. Um, um, I was a canine handler for 14 years, so had two dogs. I had Barco and Stryker, so those are my memory pictures. A couple little little items. This this guy right here used to bobble all the time on my squad car. Had him on my dash, my little bobber, bobble striker. Um, the bar, built the bar myself. Um, put my, my touches on it, the lights, the stone, everything. Um, it's solid walnut, so I can have my friends over here and we can tell stories forever. Um, obviously a bunch of my turkeys, I've combined um, the beards and the fans. They take up a lot of space, so I didn't know how many turkeys I needed to put up there. Um, these ducks were shot with my buddy Dylan, who put me on a good piece of property. Thank you, Dylan. Um, he's pretty much been a heck of a friend of mine. Um, so I mount those unique birds that I don't get that much opportunity to shoot. So over here is obviously my waterfowl section. A couple fish. Um, got my my blue goose. Was a good hunt. I never hunted snow goose or anything before, and it was in Indiana. And went down there. My buddy's like, you gotta get down there. Got down there. There was 50,000 of them, and it was just the most amazing experience I ever had. Um, these two mallards right here were probably second, third ducks I've ever mounted. They're that old. They're 20 some years old, and they still look pretty good. So. That was when I felt like I had a little knack to do waterfowl, so I took it on in my taxidermy career, and it really, it really panned out. Pretty much the same with all of these. Every time I got a unique duck that wasn't part of this flyway in this area, I mounted it up. So that's how I, how I got those. The fish. Some of them aren't the biggest fish in the world, but they were sentimental. The smallmouth bass came from a place in Michigan that I had a guy, his name was Lou Geller. He was the most inspirational man in my life. Um, from fifth grade on, he would take me to Erie, all that stuff, and he used to take me to Manistee, and I, I still go there today with my friends. And I caught that smallmouth bass, which we, we catch a lot. I just wanted one for the memory, so I mounted it. The two walleye, um, the bottom walleye I caught 20 years ago, and that was the biggest one I caught. And now with the new electronics and stuff, we've figured them out. And the top one I caught two years ago with a bunch of them like that, but I put them together, just a little clash, so we have that. These, these are my deer. These are my success stories. Um, if I say one thing, it's one. I was lucky enough to meet a man that trusted me with his property and allowed me to hunt and focus uh, on, on killing good deer. And 80% of them have come off that land. Uh, it just had the layout. I was very fortunate. These, these I have mounted on plaques have stories. This was the first deer I ever killed on his property. Small one, sentimental. Did know at that time, you know, you're talking... 20 years ago about managing big deer, didn't know, meant a lot. This one was my only Texas deer, had two days to kill it at a buddy's and he stuck me in a farm field with a bunch of cows and I, I found a couple rubs and I thought, oh, one tree, got up in it. Next morning, shot this, this guy right here. This is the very first buck I ever killed when I was 15 years old. Um, I thought it was a monster, still a monster. Very sentimental, I still kept it. So this one, not so sentimental. Hit it on opening day, can't think of the year. Coming home from work early in my squad car as I come over a hill, there he was, he was in the grill. So that was hit by my car. <laughs> I didn't get to hunt that day. The story of this buck right here, this one with a little drop time on it. I was hunting a property that morning. I actually shot probably a 150s class buck, spined him, went to the bottom of the ravine, called my buddy Mark, Mark Gatton, and said, I just killed a big one. He said, you see it? I said, I'm looking at it. He said, I'll be right there. He, he, I hung the phone up, the deer got up three times, fell over, got up four times, walked off down the creek. I couldn't believe it. He shows up, I'm like, it walked off. So we tracked this deer till, man, three o'clock in the afternoon. And granted, it was, it was the prime time. It was that first week in November. And uh, never found it, never found that deer. We gave up, went back home. I was upset. I remember it being very hot out. I'm like, you know what? I'm still wanting to hunt. I had another piece of property close to home, so I... Booked over to this other property. I literally ran 500 yards back, got my stand, sat down, was sweating, thought to myself, what am I doing? 
didn't even get my gear up, and I look up, and I saw antlers. And I, up over the top of this hill come this 12-point, and he was just huge. I couldn't believe it. And the first thing that went through my head was, my buddy Mark's not going to believe it. Well, long story short, that deer got within 40 yards of me. I never could get a shot at him. He went at me and turned around and went over the hill. I sat back down in frustration. I thought, this, is, this day is just ridiculous. Five minutes till shooting time, I looked behind me on a ridge, probably 150 yards away, see a big body deer going. And the night before, working in my shop, Michael Waddell was doing a show, and he did a snort wheeze and turned a deer. I'd never done one before. I thought, what do I have to lose? I snort wheezed. Deer kept going. I sat back down. Well, he went down and turned and came in behind me because a few minutes later, I heard snap. I turned around. There he stood broadside. It was about a 40-yard shot. I was able to stand up, get drawn, and double-lunged him, and I couldn't believe it. So that's how that day went. So it was, it was three shooters that day that were just... And for up here... In Indiana, you don't get those opportunities. Um, I know a lot of these deer aren't 150 plus class deer, but up here in Indiana, if you you get a 130 class deer, that's a good deer. Yeah, some guys are getting big ones, but their numbers aren't up here. So now this wall of fame here, this this is sentimental to me. So I built this when we built the add-on, the whole fireplace and everything, and I wanted a place to put any mounts that I would end up getting on our own property. We were fortunate enough to buy some prime. 80 acre property four years ago and I'm able to manage it myself as best I can and in four years so far those three and this guy right here have come off of it so things things are working well but I definitely wanted to showcase my biggest deer ever um, the the top one obviously one of the biggest bucks I've ever killed shot with a bow uh, I was hunting with my my friend Mark and his boy Max who I call him Lucky Max um, they were at the other end of the property um, this deer came in 15, 20 minutes for shooting time with two other bucks chasing a doe. And I was in the middle of a hard timber on an oak flat. And they came down this old logging trail. And I thought, the wind was cutting this way. They were coming this way. If I can just get that doe to get past me without busting me, I got a chance. Because I could see him hanging up back there. So she walked and stopped right by me for a second and then kept on going. I thought, uh-oh. I look up and here he come, just kind of on a slow little trot. He got in at 20 yards, broadside. I did the old, eh, smoked him. He took off, heart shot him, took off running, and then I noticed the deer behind him was every bit as big as him. And he followed him over to where he stopped and bled out. When he fell over, that other deer just stood there sniffing his, his hoofs for probably two or three minutes. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I had enough sense to get a little video clip on my phone to pull it out. And then eventually when the gig was up, he just turned around walked away and came right back at me. This year, <laughs> I broke that. This guy right here, same time, November 4th on the top one, November 5th on this corner one, and this was November 5th this year. So all in that magical, that week is when you get it done. So I'm getting aggressive grunting and rallying on a morning hunt. Same stand, same oak flat, it was that time. And this guy came in with a doe. At, I had him at 35 yards behind me, but I, could not, I couldn't get a shot at him. Um, the doe ended up turning away and going away from me. Luckily, I had a ravine that pinched him off, which brought him back in somewhat close, 60 yards. Well, shooting a Matthews bow or something, you're not going to have a chance. But because I had shoulder issues this year, I went and bought a new Raven R20, had it dialed in at 70 yards, and I'm in wide open timber. So I ranged her at 60 yards. He followed in behind her, and when he got broadside at 60 yards, I, I let it fly. That deer didn't go 100, 125 yards. We come up over a ridge, and he was literally laying like he was sleeping behind a log and I was I was I was amazed once I found out he was dead I was doing circles in the leaves and and this one here had on a bunch of camera videos in July on him and velvet he was beautiful um and he ended up getting shot on November 5th um what surprised me about him was he was only three and a half years old but he's still a beautiful buck you're not gonna pass that up but to know that was only a three and a half year old deer was was pretty amazing um so we're gonna keep going but this one here was the first deer on my property I shot. Probably won't shoot him like that anymore. Um, that's a that's a three and a half year old respectable buck up here. So my full body mount buck up here. First one I ever did. He I had pictures of him in July. I couldn't believe it. I had two days of pictures of him, and that was it. Um, the rut came. It was November fifth. Um, I was looking out over a field. He came out with three four does chasing around 150 yards away. He wouldn't respond to anything I was giving him. Um, finally, he just locked up, looked down at me, and come on a full run. Couldn't figure out why, because I was silent at the time. 
Couldn't figure out I had a button butt come out on my right end of the field, and I'm pretty sure he come down to, which brought him right into the pocket broadside. So I ended up shooting him broadside. And I, it, was, it was amazing, and the landowner and four of my good buddies ended up going with me and finding that deer that night. And I think I may have gave the landowner a kiss that night for letting me, you know, hunt his property and get that deer. So that's how that story went. But uh, this was pretty much it right here. That's where it all began. But as time goes on, you've seen our house. We thank you for coming. Um, we, we can't say enough about our passion for the outdoors. But you guys need to get your little butts on out of here and find another passionate whitetail hunter and show his crib. Thank you. <laughs>